Hello, interwebs, and welcome to another episode of Paul Owen and Dr. Witt's Colloquium on Games of Strategy by Dixit, Skeeth, and Riley, episode eight. I'm Austin Smokowitz, one half of Dr. Witt's. Aaron Hanswitz, the other half of Dr. Witt's. And Paul Owen of Vice Tower News. <laughs> and today we are discussing chapter eight. Well, my chapter eight is simultaneous move games with mixed strategy two, but we're mostly going to be focusing on non-zero sum games, general discussion. Bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. Or my book likes to call it mixed strategy in non-zero sum games. Wait, a second. you guys need some mixed strategy in zero sum games too, aren't you? Yes, my my chapter eight covered both. Yeah. General theory of simultaneous move games with mixed strategies. Right. So uh, as we get into this chapter, uh, this is so this this chapter does basically two things. It on the one hand takes the concepts that we've been learning and takes it away a little bit from the from having practical examples and just try to, tries to go into a bit of the theory of it, just kind of the pure math of it, to abstract it out into here is how this all works in a mathematical sense. Right, and it generalizes some of the results we had in previous chapters, um, where we had like some case by case, kind of needle, noodle your way through the problem and come up with an answer. Here we get a little bit more generalized approach. So whatever your matrix is, whatever your game is, you should be able to resolve a um, uh, what the right mix strategy is for an optimal solution. Well, I think there's some bigger lessons too in terms of concepts that come out of this chapter. It really shows that games have, I like to call them pivot points in certain situations where we can define using these mixed strategy equilibriums when you should be switching from one strategy to the other and when it just doesn't matter anymore. Yes. Yeah, that we talked last time about um, uh, opponent indifference, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was an interesting uh, condition where you essentially try to contrive, contrive your strategy in a way where your opponent realizes it doesn't matter what he does, he's going to get the same result. But that's because call you're that basing... The, I call that the frustrate Keith Ferguson strategy. <laughs> He like no, we, we gave him a shout out live. <laughs> <laughs> but it does create an interesting scenario where it, where your, where uh, one of the things that that one of the things about this chapter that really hit home for me is the fact that um, the payoff table matters more so than anything. If you take any payoff table and then change the numbers a little bit it can really throw off somebody's mixed strategy game even when you just tweak one of the numbers in one of the players because when you tweak one of the numbers in your opponent, you're going to change your strategy far more than your opponent will, which was interesting about this. Right. Um, the uh, uh, I thought it was interesting how you, just by tweaking, in the case of, the, the tennis game, the, the tennis game that they described here was a two by three where um, Chris Everett could either shoot down the line or cross court, as we've seen before, or the third option was a lob. And Navratilova could either defend against the cross court or the down the line shot. Just by tweaking the matrix, as you say, you could render the lob shot uh, a suboptimal strategy no matter what Navratilova does. Or conversely, you could set it up in a way that the lob shot becomes an important part of a mixed strategy. Um, and, and then either the down the line or cross court might be rendered um, uh, not used in your mixed strategy. So I thought that was, you're right, it just the slightest tweaks manipulate the lines on the uh, on the plot in such a way that you, you can shift around what your optimal strategy looks like uh, quite a bit. Yeah, there was a there was a very fun quote in my book that basically said it's interesting that if you take that tennis example, say you practice your cross, your cross cut, right? Right. Say you get really good at that, 
Right. In an actual game, what that means is that you're not going to use it all that much. And you're not going to use it as much anymore because you've gotten better at it. You know, you practice to get good at something to just not necessarily use it as much in the game because your opponent is now going to play around your new advantage. Like kind of defend against it better, yeah. 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 Well, but this has the neat concept that what you do is now forcing your opponent to respond to your training. You are changing how they play the game. And if you're doing this well, if you really fall ahead of this, you should be doing this in a way that's going to be to your advantage. Because you can use this model to predict their response, you can also predict whether or not this improves your expected payout. You know, if we talk about football, Michigan State's defense in football was known for doing things to force people to respond in particular manners because they figured out that those responses were less likely to succeed. And so they wanted them to make those, those plays because in the bigger picture, in their mixed strategy equilibrium, they were going to be more successful as a football defense. So you can use that concept not just to have surprises that Austin just described, but if you really think out that concept, you can use it to force your opponent in a less optimal strategy. Right, right. Yeah, um, I'm reminded of when, uh, uh, was it Robert Griffin III was the quarterback of the Redskins the first year he came out of college. Um, he was such a running threat as a quarterback that uh, defenses had to adjust to that in terms of defending against the quarterback run. And in doing that, they had to essentially defend less well or, or anticipate less often uh, him just throwing, dropping back and passing or, uh, or even him handing it off to another running back. So it sort of opened up the game for the Redskins because they had added, uh, essentially added another row to their, um, their play table. Right. Our thing is, is that something you do on purpose or is that something that happens on accident? Which it's a tough day because you, you know, to really take advantage of that, you have to think like a mixed strategy player. And a mixed yeah. strategy player is about balancing amongst choices. And they also have to be about being in a situation, whether it's a non-zero-sum game or a zero-sum game, where you have a reason you want to get your opponent to oscillate their decision. Right. Hmm. Uh, you know, it, I do feel like in the NFL, that, that kind of the paradigm, at least among us fans, right, is uh, that you use the running game to open up the passing game and the passing game to open up the running game. Um, whereas in baseball, uh, um, you, Austin talked about um, uh, if you improve your cross-court cut cross -court shot, you actually might end up using it less. I think in baseball, a pitcher might work to improve his, his curveball with the intent to actually use the curveball to, um, uh, but uh, and not necessarily... Uh, to force batters to defend it against it and therefore make his fastball more effective. Um, so I would agree. Uh, I I have developed the curveball so that you are thinking about am I about to throw the curveball and not looking for the fastball. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And that also might mean I never really use the curveball except maybe every once in a while to show you that I can do it. Right, right. To threaten it, right. threaten it. Yes. Right. So the way the book talks about this kind of stuff is the idea of um, the, um, the, so there's a section heading that's in, the opponent's indifference and guarding against exploitation. That sometimes you do that, like you do throw the fastball just to still say, hey, I can throw the fastball. Can you, are you still up for right. defending against this? Because right. you know I'm good at my curve. I'm going to yeah. throw my curve a lot, but I still have to keep you honest right you just can't sit on the curveball yep and in the discussion in my book they talk about the fact that when you have this type of situation um you there you do need to keep using this you still need to throw that fastball you still have to right. throw the pass on third you know on third and one just so that you can keep the defense off guard and keep them guessing. Right. But it does have to be a credible thing. So, for example, if you've got a pure strategy that is just universally not very good, like say your team 
can never seem to pull off a screen pass and gain any kind of yardage out of it, then having a mixed strategy that includes your screen pass isn't going to do any good. That would be one of those cases of a pure strategy that gets eliminated from your mixed strategy because uh, all other strategies are better or some combination of other strategies is better than, than your screen pass, no matter how the enemy defends against it. So and, the, you'd only, you'd have to develop each strategy to be sufficiently, to be f sufficiently, I guess, uh, proficient at it or effective at it to include it in your mixed strategy. Otherwise it doesn't do any good. And, and again, this is true for a zero sum game and a non zero sum game. Although, I mean, it, the non zero sum games are a bit different because in non zero sum games, it doesn't mean we're working against each other. It just right. means that if I'm better off if you're rotating what you're doing than if you're always doing the same thing, potentially. I have an incentive that I want to see you oscillating your behavior in response to what I'm doing. Because if I become too right. predictable, you can choose an outcome that is not as an advantage to me as if we were oscillating. Right. And the, the interesting point is that even though you may not want to, this is still something you need to do in, in all given circumstances. It's a thing you should consistently do. You randomly consistently do. And, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we tend to, you know, there's, there's a big difference between the regular, you know, between preseason, the regular season and the playoffs, and then, you know, the Super Bowl, right? And right. what's interesting is that the math will, you know, the, the, the math and the theory says that it doesn't matter which of these parts of the season you are in, you should still take these sometimes riskier things, sometimes riskier plays, just because you have to keep your, you know, you still have to keep your opponents uh, guessing. Right. And well, I was going to say I'm excited here because now you guys are. We, we a long time ago we had this discussion about combining sequential games with simultaneous games. And when you guys talked about it, it was all in pure strategy, Nash equilibrium. But what you guys are doing now are combining sequential games and simultaneous game and using mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium. So I want to make sure the everyone notices that that. We're combining game types here when we're doing this analysis. We're not just looking at one type of game anymore. We're combining both game types again, but using mixed strategy Nash equilibrium with our So maybe I don't maybe I don't see that. I, I, I thought I heard Austin describing a, a series of um, separate but a, but sequential simultaneous move games. It, uh, I think of a sequential game as one in which the set of decisions available to each person is different depending upon the decisions that were made prior to that. So, so if I playing series series of um, games of chicken, <laughs> for example, um, how each one results from the one before it do doesn't depend how the, the situation that I'm faced with the decision that I'm faced with in the third round is no different regardless of the decisions or outcomes that were made in the first two rounds. And and that is true. I mean, not every game we talk about today is going to be a co combination, sequential, simultaneous move game. But when you're talking about football, for example, what happens on first down is going to affect your decision on second down. And, and those downs mm -hmm. are sequential moves, but the action in each move is a simultaneous game, and you have a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium on that part of the game tree. That, that's a good Point. That's the point. It's pro for four yards. I positioned myself well for second down, as opposed to um, I, I might make a different choice with a different payoff range, uh, depending on how I want to pre-position myself for second down. And and there's a game within my book where it's doing the football game, and it's using that to pre-plan. Uh, you're in a third and long situation. Do I go for two short plays to try to get the first down, mm -hmm. or do I have two long plays? And I think the assumption right. was you had first down at that in that series. Right, right. But what sportscasters will call a four-down situation when it's 
third down and you just figure, well, I'm going to go again if I, I don't have to get all nine yards or whatever is left for my first down in one play if I consider myself in a four down situation. And therefore, that means that the defense has to be more prepared for, for a greater variety of plays because they know the offense may not necessarily have to commit to a long range play. A long range oh, play. Well, you know, if, if you if you don't succeed in any of those downs, you know, I mean, there is that one situation where you know what they're going to do. You know, you're fourth and long. Right. Right. And then, the, it's, then mm-hmm. it's not so much of a multi-strategy game. The fourth, down, fourth and long situation is just a matter of skill Then how well do you play upon? What's well, it at that point? It isn't, but when you're making the initial decisions and you're thinking ahead, I mean, that's sort of, that's the sub game, yes. the sub game. Right. Right, right. You just know that if you if it's a branch that of a sequence of branches of decisions that you make get you to that fourth and long situation, then there's really not much of a branching for the next play. But you're right. I, generally speaking, the office will try to avoid getting to that point. Right. And that will affect the prior decisions. Uh, now, the, oh, sorry, Austin, go ahead. Yeah, no. So uh, the 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 example that that they're using in, in my book is in my edition is the idea that instead of third and long and knowing you're going to try to make two plays to get your first down anyway, like you're going to play on fourth because it's short. This gives the example of it's third and one, right? So it's third down, there's one yard to go and the safe play is to just hand off the ball, right? Do a, do a quick, do a quick run or try to do something around the side or up the middle. Right. But the idea is that every once in a while, you should try to pass long, right? right? And Otherwise, the defense will put eight in the box and you'll never get a runoff. Yep. Right. And so the, the question that's brought up in the book, though, is that, okay, so we know that you should still have a mixed mix. But if, if it's a long pass and third down, you know, if that's in October, then you would, you know, you're more willing to make the pass. But right. let's say it's the Super Bowl. Are you willing to make the pass then? Are you willing to take that more risky play because in theory, you know, in theory, more is at stake, and right. your payoff matrix is exaggerated. Right. But if that's the case, and you're being knocked out of your your mixed strategy nasty equilibrium, room, now you get into this bluffing game with the defense. Right. No, but they. they but the idea here is that even when it's the Super Bowl, you should not get knocked out of your your uh, Nash equilibrium. That's right, but you're about to explain why. But <laughs> if you get knocked out of your mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, the defense always knows what they should be doing, and that will be right. to your disadvantage. Right. right, right. Which is why, the, which is where you get the phrase "defenses win Super Bowls," and that's because. The offense stops playing so risky because it's the Super Bowl. Isn't that great? <laughs> Interesting. So let's see if we can start, start pointing us to some board game examples. Oh, sure. In terms of sports, which are, don't get me wrong, type of game. Uh, and of course, we could talk about Austin, my prototype overtime, as, as the example for these football games. But. I don't think that I think it'd be better if we could generalize to some games that more people would, would have played. So if you want to play for time, join our email list at com, and you can pass the play testing event and we will happily show you how to play overtime. It's a great two player football game with where blocking matters and commitment matters like a real football game. Yeah, I've I played that in Unpub. That was fun. I like that game. Uh, that was strictly sequential, right? There was no, I don't recall any simultaneous decisions in that game. Is that right? That's right. It's strictly sequential. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was thinking about Citadels. Have you, if, I don't know if you guys have played that. Um, Citadels is a game where uh, you're secretly choosing a role, uh, one of eight roles, and they each has a special power, and they're drafted so that when the, your decision comes along, You've got some idea of what your opponent might have taken, or some idea of what your opponent, what choices your opponent may have left to take. But you're never certain what your opponent has taken, um, and 
I feel like I might have talked about this before, but one of the roles is the assassin, which uh, allows you to name another role. And if somebody else took that role, they lose their turn. Um, and there are other roles that are really valuable to have, like the architect gives you two free cards and the um, merchant gives you at least one free coin. Um, so there's a tendency in terms of payoff to want to take the merchant or the architect, except for the fact that the person who takes the assassin will typically assassinate either the merchant or the architect. So the, uh, that, that kind of, I can see where you might construct a, a mixed strategy out of, you know, I, I want to take the merchant more often than just one in eight times, but I don't want to take it too often. And if I'm the architect, I want to pick the merchant more often, but I don't want to take it too often because then somebody else will just take the bishop or something else all the time and never get assassinated. So I can definitely see where this kind of mixed strategy combined with bluffing uh, would apply to a game like that. I'm trying to think of a, if any of the dexterity games would lend well to this, especially Austin's point where you become really good at something, do you change your, your mixed strategy approach? I think the challenge I'm having is a game like Looping Louie to me, in the end becomes a sequential game. Uh, unless I'm, I'm just thinking I'm not moving fast enough because, you know, Looping Louie, if I become really good at nailing the guy to my right, uh, that's going to adjust the strategy on the guy to the right to, to either try to take me out or make sure I never get a shot at it. But is that really a mixed strategy now? So it's a, a response to a sequential game. Yeah. It depends on whether you have to decide what to do before your opponent, ha before you can see what your opponent has done. Like, I, think know I mean, in Looping Louie, you do see what they've done. It's so, it's also part of a question of how fast your reaction is right. to what they've done. Sure. And so that's, that's the challenge I've had in trying to think of examples. Like the ones that have come to mind could be Rhino Hero, Looping Louie. In the end, there's still a sequential game. So, But I feel like a dexterity game this is lends so well to sports there should be a dexterity game out there that picks up on this and if there isn't then that tells me that we need one but aaron how fast does looping louis move how fast does that guy move in that air in his airplane if you've hot wired your machine or not <laughs> but i mean the the whole idea with the tennis examples is that in a tennis game it's sequential if you want to think of it that way, it's just that the action is happening fast enough that you have to kind of make your decision before you really see what they do. And the question is, is Looping Louie fast enough where every time it comes to you, I should be thinking, this is the time he's going to loop it back to me because I'm on, you know, I'm on his right. And even though I just passed it to him, should I now just automatically expect you to flip it back my way. And I need to be ready to, you know, to counter that. Well, and that point, that's why I have problems looping with an example. I think unless you've hot rod, or hot rod your looping system. Nitrous. Then, right, my nitrous looping Louis system. Gotta get that little German guy flying even wackier. Uh, we both spin our fingers at the same time, even though no one saw it. It's not fast enough, and that that's, tells me a sense of opportunity here. You know, if, if for a dexterity game has that element that is short of being us just playing a whole new sport. Not yeah, I can't to, think of a I can't think of a simultaneous decision dexterity game, tabletop dexterity game. Well, there's um. What was it? Uh, it? Apparently, as soon as I try to go online, my entire internet slows down, so I don't want to do that anymore. But, I mean, try to search for anything else. But there is the, um, it premiered, I believe, last year. It's a two-player, it's a wooden game where you have your hand underneath the table and you're moving around the one yeah. prong. Like, Clinko or Kesko or something like that. It, it's something. I mean, it, it's... Clask. Cla Could it be Clask? 
I need to do some searching. But I mean, I, that is a game that I know exists. And if you have two good players moving at fast speeds, then, you know, it's your reaction time versus their reaction time. Um, but you get into the same feeling. I mean, but it's also in, but the only downside of that is that um, unlike, say, a game of tennis, you don't have the entire board to play with you still have your one section that you're trying to guard against mm -hmm. if your opponent has the ball and really has the puck and really it's just a question of well is it you know are they going to try to bank it or shoot it in but you know it's still kind of going to the one place i don't i don't know if the goal is big enough for that um mm -hmm. For, for non dexterity games, I mean, Paul brought up a great example of Citadels. We got the diplomacy. We talk about prototype cattle car. I think of a, a bunch of games where you have sequential moments of simultaneous movements that works really well. Right. And and I mean, I enjoy games like that because I like having that moment where everyone's making that action because that's a very tense moment in, in football. That's a very tense moment where something big is going to happen. And then you have a, a, a pause, you have another turn, and you react to it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in board games, you see that right now just being limited to non dexter games. And I said, they, they, I've seen things that do it well, whether right, where it's our, our cattle car game, which involves people simultaneously making their decisions on how they're going to hire people and move cattle, whatever we're talking about diplomacy, where people make simultaneous decisions where they're going to move, but then they have this pause in the action. Diplomacy is more repeated play of simultaneous games. I should correct that one. And maybe that's, that's how I should think of cattle car as well. <laughs> but right. diplomacy is still sequential, right? I mean, each the board state on each turn depends on the decisions made on the previous turn. That's true. And that's true for cattle car as well, but but that could be a repeated. Uh, now I'm trying to make sure I understand these these this this concept of these sequential simultaneous game. Yeah. Which I I think is a is a very important thing for us to have straight because. In a way, isn't it a, it's a sequence of simultaneous games, not necessarily branching, but where the decision table, the payoff table is populated by results from the preceding simultaneous uh, yes. decision game or turn, really. And... and you're trying to construct the future decision matrix to be in your advantage, to be to your advantage. Mm. So now, one aspect of this chapter, of course, I mentioned the, the, the fact that it's, it was very mathematical in terms of the way it approached these um, mixed strategy games. Um, it assumed a linear relationship between the discrete strategies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you ended up with linear combinations of strategies as mixed strategies. Uh, and then the combination of those with your opponent's strategy ended up with your your equilibrium point by by optimizing that equilibrium uh, that that linear combination. Um, the interesting thing about that, though, of course, is it's hard to math out unless you have a well-defined payoff matrix and a small number of strategies. It's a whole hard thing to math out in practice. So I, I found that whereas the 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 construct and the uh, going through the um, the algebra was illustrative. I was struggling with how to apply that to design. You know, how do we make sure that uh, le learning from this, what, what do we bring to our game design to benefit from that, to make for a better game? Hmm. That's the thing I was struggling with. That's where I go back to that, that importance of realizing there's these pivot points in the game. And if it's really easy to these pivot points, then players are no longer playing 
the game, the game is playing dumb. How do you mean? So if if I'm playing a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium game and I'm not engaging in any bluffing or any threats that could possibly be credible, then I have just mathematically calculated the pivot points. And if I think I can read you, I know what choice to make. And if I don't know if I can read you, then I just play the mass, the, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium knowing that that will give me the best possible outcome, assuming I know nothing about you that suggests you don't know the information. Right. Uh, and once I think you have a tendency, I, I know to switch from playing one way or the other. And so it just builds into the constant fear we have about game design that players stop playing the game and the game stops playing them. Even the things that we maybe originally thought were immune to that possibility, we're discovering they aren't if, if it, people are able to figure this out. It goes back to the very first problem we had with the basic game theory that if things aren't complex enough, it's solvable. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and then on the on the other side of the spectrum, there's this idea, uh, my edition goes into this idea that they have a, on the other side of this, my edition has a couple of examples where there are, there is counterintuitive thinking in the results of your payoff tables, like in the results of your um, Nash equilibriums, you know, specifically changing over time. And, you know, you, you know, depending on the scenario, you think you should do this, but in fact, your, you know, um, your payoffs say, you know, your, your P mix um, says otherwise. And one of the things though that they mention is that uh, you know, experiment like when you take these concepts and move them out of the theoretical back into uh, into actual experiments, people don't necessarily pick up on the subtleties that are being changed in the system, and thus they will not map to your theoretical uh, solutions. <laughs> in other words, um, you know, the experimental evidence shows. Um, you know, don't, you can't use your experimental, you can't use your math to say this is how it will play out in reality because people will not necessarily follow along. Right. Um, I, I think what I hear you saying is people don't necessarily behave rationally. Um, or. Sure. <laughs> Maybe what he's saying is that the cost. You guys have no idea what I'm saying. I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> is no, uh, to actually act rationally is high enough that people don't do it. And people are using mnemonics to try to reduce the information cost, and that can get them in trouble. Now, we can even see, now we're starting to branch in psychology, the, the idea that giving you those negative points in the agricola may actually prevent you from doing the optimal strategy because you're too busy thinking negative points are bad versus just optimizing your point total. And you're yeah. letting it mislead you in your playing strategy. Um, I don't know if you heard Jeff Engelstein on, I forget if it was a ludology or if he was a guest on the Dice Tower, and he posed questions um, that were essentially differently worded statements of the same problem and got different results from the audience. Um, and that was consistent with experimentation that had happened before. Basically, one of them was something like you have a, a, a medicine that uh, you have a, a, um, a treatment that will cure um, 200 people guaranteed. You have another treatment that has a one third chance of curing any of 600 people. Um, which one would you prefer? And uh, and people in general will, will pick the opportunity for more people and therefore the, the one third chance for 600 people. Um, on the other hand, if you have a cure uh, or a treatment that will result in the death of 400 people and another that will um, result in the death of two thirds of 600 people, um, which one would you prefer? And they prefer 
Um, uh, maybe I've got them backwards. I don't know. But anyway, they, they answer the question differently when they're really but two the, statements of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. They're just expressing the same expected values in different forms. But that right. said, so we to to that. Yeah. experiments like that rely on people not playing something over and over again. Because hmm. when you start getting repeated play of the game, you start learning that these things are just cheap talk. They're just distractions from the actual numbers. And, uh. and we get in board game geek, the people will figure out you really should do this. And, and sometimes when this happens, you get designers upset because sometimes they have those flavors they don't want you to do that. Right, that, right. I don't know. So you, you have, I love, I love East India Company, which is one of Paul's prototypes. And I discovered, well, wait a second. There's this loan borrowing thing. And if <laughs> we go bank, I don't do react emotionally to that. That's true. And I don't know if that was Paul's intent or not, but having seen the game enough times, I could start saying, well, this looks like it might be the optimal strategy and who cares what it sounds like. <laughs> So, so even though there's this fear in real-world applications, the games won't match their 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 theory outcomes. If you let right. people play over and over again, again, they're going to learn. If you look at experimental economics, uh, so experimental e economists and behavioral economists both do experiments to see how people behave to see if they confirm the economic theory. Uh -huh. And and I like both of them, but. The way I describe them is a behavioral economist plays a game once and it doesn't meet the game theory prediction and they go, oh no, game theory doesn't work. And the experimental uh. game, game theory, the experimental economist plays the game with the players three times. First time it doesn't work, second time it might work, and the third time people know what's happening and it behaves the way the game theory predicts. And they go, oh look, game theory works. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. But Interesting based on the idea that you have repeated play so people can learn how the game works to take advantage of it and not be fooled by the wording, not be fooled by wrong uh, intuitions. Right. That is funny. Which is why, if we're talking about game design, when you play test a game, you need play testers who not just play the game the first time, but play the game multiple times so you have both the initial reaction to a game and the long-term outcomes right. to the game once people know the details of the game. Right, for definitely true. And the game free might work. Course, you're talking about a game that people would buy and take home and play more than once. Right. Yeah. Which, really with the same people or far to the same people, yeah. Which, of course, then gets into a different discussion about should we expect people to play the game more than once? <laughs> And the answer in the general case is yes, but there are certainly yes. games that we play that you only play once in your life. Right. Um, so slightly, slightly switching gears. Um, I want to talk to you guys about one of the concepts in here. I, I want to, I want to dive a little bit into the exact concept of the P, uh, the, the exact concept of the P mix, the idea of, where your your expected value is in your range of your the, the linear the linear combination the linear combination so i want to talk specifically about chicken about the game chicken so yes. in a very classical sense of chicken if two people swerve nobody gets points if one swerves and one stays straight one gets one point. The guy, the person who stayed straight gets a point. The person who swerves gets negative one point. And then if they both stay straight, they both get negative two points. Right. And if you take that as the very, as the very simplistic table and you say that, um, you know, crashing or both staying straight gives you the same amount and swerving each gives you, you know, one person does not have a higher negative value upon swerving than the other, and you kind of keep these numbers all kind of equal out, 
you know, right. these numbers low, just one and two points each in the positive to negative direction, then what you end up with on a p-mix is that effectively chicken becomes without, you know, if you don't have any signaling and you don't have any bluffing, chicken becomes effectively a coin toss. It becomes a 50-50 chance where half the time you're going to uh, swerve and half the time you're going to um, you're going to stay straight and the thing that I was that I'm actually really curious about is what happens on what happens on that point where it is like if I'm reading these charts right so on the graph it's like for the first 50% of the time you're going to stay straight. And on the second 50% of the time, you're going to swerve. But there's a point where you're uh, at, at the 50% mark, your uh, equilibrium uh, switches between those two points. Right. And the thing that, that, I've, that I've kind of been curious about now, at least for the last two chapters, is that when you actually hit that line in your decision making, does that in itself become say, uh, uh, another coin toss. <laughs> a toss, if you're doing it correctly. But it's only a coin toss that you're going to utilize if you think your opponent is doing the same thing. Yes. But once you know, but once, yeah. Once you know if your opponent is not doing the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, then you have an obvious choice which will result in you being better off than just the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Right. If your opponent just got a new paint job on his car, it seems more likely that he's going to swerve. If he's a, uh, a, a crazed lunatic who just lost his girlfriend, then he's probably not going to swerve. And so you can anticipate that and act accordingly. If it's Keith Ferguson, you're bad at mathematics. You might just calculate the, the <laughs> equilibrium. You might just toss a coin. It's, no, I, I think if it was in that case, I would throw a calculator at him, and then he'd get distracted. <laughs> or... And and I do, and I always, and I do find this to be really interesting because in other examples of chicken that I've you know have heard about. Uh, you know, everyone loves pointing to the Cuban Missile Crisis as uh, as a ch as a game of chicken. I never thought of it in terms of what do we do? Oh, we just flip a coin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> how did how did we solve the Cuban Missile Crisis? Oh, we both just flipped coins, and it all worked out. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> what you know. It's I, I got to admit, there are times, you know, where, so I'm going to bring back Major League Baseball, right, where, you know, the pitcher's got maybe two or three pitches to choose from, and it used to be that, that the catcher would kind of signal to him what to do, and now it's more like the catcher looks at the dugout and the coach signals the catcher what to tell the pitcher to do. And I sort of wonder if the coach has got a table down there and a die, and he rolls a die and says, <laughs> get a fastball, you know. Oh, right, so the – the coaches are just playing stratomatic on the on the sides with the, with this year's players. Oh, yeah. Roll your three dice. Okay, yeah. curveball low and inside. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> That's right. I've got a different matrix for every batter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be funny. I, I see what you mean, though, but it's, it seems odd to think that it would reduce to your own die roll. You know, once you've once you've perfectly optimized situation. And again, this goes to an important point that Aaron made. The assumption is that you have no insight into what your opponent's going to do. Mm -hmm. And if you have no insight into what your opponent's going to do, you want a mixed strategy that renders your opponent's decision immaterial, you know, make the opponent indifferent. And that's where that probability thing comes in. What's, it's not about making your opponent indifferent. It's about finding the expected value that maximizes your payoff. And that's going to be when your opponent is indifferent. Yes. Uh, more precise. Yeah. And right. once you discover that they aren't, 
and indifferent even this isn't the right word it's not it's not necessarily well what it means is no matter what they do you get the same expected value yes and that your opponent's indifferent it's just that you know what you're going to earn and unless they do something that tells you they're going to do one particular pattern of the other then you can take advantage of them right and, and that advantage isn't necessarily at the 50 50 point that 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 depends on the game you know it might be 70 30 it might be 60 40 but the key thing here is they're they're not playing the right probabilities to ensure that your mixed strategy natural equilibrium is the best you can do and once they leave that then you have a a choice that will always be better off versus the other choice right no your, your mixed strategy natural equilibrium prevents your opponent from taking advantage of you but it also and that's true for both sides but it's also a guide for you to watch your opponent and figure out are they playing their mixed strategy natural equilibrium correct and if they aren't then again you know your decision and you take advantage of their lack of knowledge or keeps them the ability to do math <laughs> And, and that's where it gets, um, and that's where it really gets tricky because when you're playing these games with other people, you have to try to figure that out on the fly. That are they actually keeping me indifferent, or have I discovered the thing that they are doing that I can now exploit to my advantage? because one of these interesting factors about most of these games is that you can, you by using a mixed strategy, you can get a good payoff, but if your opponent is always doing one particular, is doing a pure strategy, you can take advantage of that and get a better payoff for yourself. And the great thing about this is this is taking games where we initially just think of it as as cycling you know because a lot of times in these pure strategy Nash equilibriums you might be facing a game where there could be multiple Nash equilibriums uh, or no Nash equilibriums and it is allowing us to actually have a strategy to the game to make it strategic and that's one of the bright things even though i am fearful that it leads the game playing the people versus the people playing the game and another hand it does a lot of a strategy in that situation on how you can maximize your ability to do well in that game and how you can recognize an opponent Keith who is uh, not as skilled All right. and take advantage of that take advantage of that now watch it keep gonna mop me up the next time we play uh -huh. if you with me well, it depends on the game, right? <laughs> you're gonna have to play his. You're gonna have to play these guys as. Um, is it one card? The marvelous, marvel. Magnificent marvels. Magnificent marvels. You're gonna have to play these guys as magnificent marvels, so that Keith knows all the cards, all the rules, and you're learning from scratch. Right. He might be a little bit more game for that. <laughs> Design it so so at least Paul knows the math so That's he right. might too. <laughs> right, and that is of course something. And that is of course something that as a designer you still have to figure out how to not only have these payoff tables because when you're talking about a board game these payoff tables become in ev nearly everything that the players are going to get their head around whether they're conscious about it or not but then you also have to find a way to it would be great to be able to change those over the core over the course of the the gaming experience so that players have to adapt on the fly and might not necessarily know what it is that either they have they could do or their opponents could do to keep them indifferent and their opponents indifferent 
Right. Well, that, that's fatigue or that could be other things, but that gets back to the earlier point that if you're a skill in the game and you're playing ahead, you can purposely sharpen or, or lower your skills in particular areas to drive your opponents to play a particular mixed strategy that's more to your advantage. So, I mean, and, and that gets back again to the strategic element. These games can still be highly, highly strategic, even though what you're doing is balancing the odds. And right. if you're playing time trying to figure it out, you know, until it's completely calculated out where it's just pre-programmed, you're still in the game. And yeah. like, like all of our discussions, if you keep the game complicated enough, it's going to be a while, if ever, anyone finds that perfect point. Yes, yes. So I think that wraps it up for us tonight. I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Before we head out, I want to make sure people know that um, the next topic we're going to be talking about is uh, just head in front of me. The next topic we're talking about when we meet again is uncertain information. In all of our books, we have graduated to part three. And bum, now bum, 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 bum. part three, we've done it, everybody. We made it. <laughs> and we're, part three is going to involve some detailed discussions and either some, some topics or games in game theory. And a lot of these games are, are applied to a variety of situations. So we're moving on to the next. It's like we're graduating a level of the course, as, as Austin put in it. So, well, Paul, as the Val Victorian of our class, do you have any graduations to close us out with tonight? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're signing off now. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is uh, Paul Owen. Uh, uh, most probably familiar on uh, Dice, the Dice Tower News podcast, also on Twitter at Paul Owen Games and Board Game Geek PD Owen 3. And, and what's your speech? You, Beth Val Victorian, you have to have some line oh, of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, forever calculate your odds. <laughs> uh, I think it's a uh, optimize, optimize, optimize. <laughs> That's that's the school raw watch here, you know, at the football games. <laughs> I'm I'm going to take a quote from the book here, dealing with evidence on mixing in non-zero sum games. Something we didn't really talk about, but something to keep in mind. The overall conclusion is that mixed strategy equilibria in non-zero sum games should be interpreted and used at best with considerable caution. Something, <laughs> something that we will definitely be looking more at in part three. <laughs> so, so, of course, you can find Dr. Witz online at dr.wictz.com or on Twitter at drwictz. And Paul can be found on Twitter, as he said before, at Paulo and Games. And don't forget, Paul's a great blog as well. And uh, Oh, yes, he... uh, paulowingames.blogspot.com. It's a man overboard blog. Um, that's uh, haven't had a post recently on there, but my intention is to compile notes from our uh, our series here and, and post those uh, as kind of a, a written summary of what we've, what we've talked about. In other words, he's writing the crib notes. <laughs> yes, that's right. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. It's, as always, this is a lot of fun. It really I'm, is. I'm looking forward to our, our, our next new section of the script. Now that we have graduated from the basics of, of this game theory, we're going to talk more in detail about advanced topics. Yay. Very cool. All right. And...